Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, I think I know most of the people in this room. Uh, I'm Brad Hawes, the director of the Honors Program here at Washington Abbott University. Uh, and as our uh, continuing 10th anniversary progresses, uh, we are having yet another amazing presentation this evening. Uh, I am very pleased to um, have something on the 100th anniversary of BLAST. Uh, many of you don't know what BLAST is, and hopefully that will change this evening if you haven't been over to the English department and seen the exhibition there yet. Uh, but BLAST is a very interesting um, phenomenon and an uh, amazing object. I hope that you all will find a way of uh, understanding it this evening. Uh, I was uh, sharing with our guest speaker that I found it quite interesting that uh, tonight's presentation corresponds with uh, November the 5th. And if anybody is from, from England or has watched V for Vendetta or seen the graphic novel, you know that it's Guy Fox night. And it's the night when uh, fireworks are usually uh, set off in England. Uh, and that was because uh, Guy Fox uh, decided that he and uh, several other conspirators were going to try and, and blow up, uh, uh, I believe it was Parliament. And uh, he didn't succeed. And so they celebrate on November the 5th uh, the, that the gunpowder plot didn't succeed. Remember, uh, remember, the 5th, the 5th of, November, of November, the gunpowder treason is plot. I can think of no reason the gunpowder treason should ever be forgotten. There you go. <laughs> so it's November the 5th. So penny for the guy and all that. Uh, but also, I think that that's quite interesting because uh, V for Vendetta was a popular graphic novel and then it was turned into a very popular movie. And then since then, the mask that was worn in that film has become an icon for uh, social revolution, uh, for, for change in society, that Guy Fox is seen as a, as a rebel. Uh, and I think that that does correlate very well with the graphic culture of Blast, uh, this very you know, garish pink cover with a, a bold typography, it's blast. And it is something that's trying to grab our attention, is trying to uh, create uh, some uh, stir in, in British culture in 1914. So uh, this evening, I'm very pleased to introduce our, our guest speaker, um, Professor Sean Latham from the University of Tulsa. Uh, he is currently the director of the Oklahoma Center for Humanities. Uh, he is the Pauline Farland Walter Dow Chair in the English Department. He is the editor of the James Joyce Quarterly, and he is the co-director of the Modernist Journals Project. And the Modernist Journals Project is uh, uh, co-sponsored by the University of Tulsa and Brown University, and is an amazing archive, a digital archive, of a number of rare magazines from around this period that uh, is worth your attention. Uh, so this is an amazing resource. If you get interested in little magazines that last uh, tonight, uh, there is a world to explore uh, online with this amazing archive uh, that uh, Professor Latham has had a large role in, in creating. Uh, so uh, this evening, um, Professor Latham is going to be talking about uh, new media modernism, blast in video games. And when he first uh, wrote to me, I said, what would you like to speak about? And he said, well, I'd like to do a reading of blast using video game theory. And then he put in parenthesis, seriously. <laughs> uh, and I said, this sounds great. I'm really interested to, to hear what he has to say. And uh, having had many conversations with him throughout the day, uh, I am very intrigued by some of these ideas. And I think I'm going to learn uh, quite a bit as well. So please join me in welcoming mm -hmm. Professor Sean Latham. Thank you very much, Brett. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, and quite happy to be here to help celebrate, I guess, the 10th anniversary of the Honors Program, and even more excitingly, maybe to mark the, the 100th anniversary of Blast, which was this sort of phenomenally weird magazine um, that I'll try to say a little bit uh, about tonight, and try to use some, maybe some, you know, some terms that video games can help us uh, understand and talk about why Blast was such a weird and interesting thing when it first appeared. And indeed, it remains pretty weird today, as you see. Um, so I'm going to begin with a, with a simple question, because simple questions are often best. And it's one that's often asked, but rarely earns a satisfactory answer, which is, what is modernism? We often think about Blast as a sort of iconic image, uh, iconic uh, object for modernism, but what is modernism anyway? And in a shameless bit of self-promotion, I can tell you I'm writing a book uh, <laughs> that answers that very question called Modernism, History of an Idea. Uh, so make sure to buy it. Um, so tonight, though, you get a little preview of what some of those answers might be. And I think they generally fall into two separate categories. The first, which is derived from T.S. Eliot and then refined by a group we call the New Critics, and other deft readers of difficult texts, contends that modernism is basically a distinct set of aesthetic practices that emphasize the formal structures of an aesthetic 
object. So Beckett offered, Samuel Beckett, the Irish playwright, offered what I still think is the, a very workable definition of this understanding of modernism. When he wrote of Joyce's Finnegan's Wake, the quote, give me a slide here, Joyce's writing is not about something, it is that something itself. In painting and the visual arts, Clement Greenberg made a similar kind of argument about modernism as the discovery of the medium. The unique and proper area of competence for work of art, he wrote, is the manipulation of those features unique to the particular nature of a medium. For Greenberg, in other words, what made paintings modern was they stopped caring in some ways about what was actually on the canvas, uh, sort of what was being represented on the canvas, and cared more about pigment and paint and texture. So form in this understanding of modernism trumps content, or rather, form and content become indistinguishable from one another. Now, the second kind of answer to this question, what is modernism, was largely pioneered by the new modernist studies. It basically shrugs in response and says that modernism is nothing more than an unfortunate term used to describe the multifold aesthetic experiments of a period that stretches roughly from 1880 to 1940. And I have to say, in this model, there's always this kind of twinge of regret, right? We look backwards, we're always jealous of the Victorians, we modernists. Uh, they, have this big, they have this very convenient monarch that sort of dies and, and or, you know, comes to power and dies on very convenient dates to create a Victorian period. We've got nothing like that in the 20th century, so we sort of cast around hoping to settle on something else and got this sort of desultory modernism, right? And there are lots of problems with this term, one of which is obviously, when does modernism end? You know, when, when do we stop being modern? What happens after modernism? And you get sort of crazy words like postmodernism or post-contemporary and other sort of attempts to describe what happens after modernism. So there are problems, of course, with both these models, the formalist one on the one hand, and, this, and the, we'll call it the historical one on the other. The formalist one is constraining in that it produces a very narrow canon of works. So a writer like Gertrude Stein, for example, makes the cut, whereas D.H. Lawrence or C.S. Lewis do not. And the historicist one too easily loses sight of genuinely innovative work of the period. It forgets why we actually care about things like Gertrude Stein and James Joyce. If modernism is everywhere, in other words, then that means it's also nowhere. So, my own answer to the question, what is modernism, seeks to negotiate these two extremes by looking to the radical changes in media technology that began with the Edison era, Edison era and extend into our own digital age. So as the media theorist Friedrich Kittler argued, Thomas Edison and other inventors of the late 19th century began to separate out data flows carving up the once unified human sensorium into different kinds of recording, storage, and transmission devices. Right, this is Edison's great insight, to sort of take the human body and start slicing it up and see that the body produces different kinds of data. Each of these data can be stored, reproduced, and transmitted in different ways. So the phonograph, for example, becomes an artificial ear. I mean, early phonographs look like ears. Right, the, the cinema becomes an artificial eye, and the typewriter a newly automated hand. You can give me another slide here. Kittler calls this actually a discursive machine gun. And this is one of the, uh, this is one of the very first pages of Blast, where you can see sort of uh, this magazine's attempt to, to seize that weapon, to seize the discursive machine gun. So modernism, I want to argue today, and this is a huge claim, so you can argue with me on the point, can best be defined as a diverse and very formal and thematic set of responses to the arrival of new media technologies beginning with Edison and leading up into the present day. It thus encompasses not only things like the headline sections that appear and break up Joyce's Ulysses, or the chuck chuck chuffing of the record player in Virginia Woolf's Between the Acts, or the camera eye sections of John Dos Passos' 42nd Parallel. It also includes the typographic explosions of blacks, which you see here, but also genres like science fiction and detective novels, which arise in the same period, as well as comic books we just talked about, Vita's for Vendetta. Uh, and the suffragist movement's multimedia campaign for the vote. It also includes modern magazines, I would claim, an old medium made new by the invention of bitonal printing, the rotary press, the modern postal system, and inexpensively manufactured paper. Another slide, please. Uh, right, and so here I'm trying to give you a sense of that long reach of, the, of new media. All right, so when we think about new media as really only being the computer, uh, but really we've been dealing with sort of waves of new media reaching back to, to Edison and his early phonograph here on the left through the Lumiere brothers and the first set of the, one of the very first uh, 
projected pieces of cinema there. That's the uh, camera was named the ENIAC computer at uh, the University of Illinois. And this is a sort of precursor to the, uh, the hypertext here. Uh, and of course, the very first commercial video game. Um, Right. And, I, and so one of my claims is these things actually form a, con, a comprehensive arc across the 20th century, that we don't want to try to artificially cut that, uh, that media history in half. Right? And, so because, and because these new media technologies continue to develop, my definition suggests that modernism is still an ongoing process. We're still in this place where our senses are being cut up and reassembled. And thus, at least, we still encounter an un unfolding set of aesthetic responses that share an array of affiliation with the late 19th and early 20th century when these media revolutions began. Indeed, as my title suggests, I would like to argue that video games are, in fact, distinctly modernist works. That games might, in fact, be the very thing at which and toward which modernism had been aiming since it first began to emerge in response to the Edisonian revolution. And that's an even bigger claim that we can argue about later, if you like. Um, that is, that, that modernism was sort of imperfectly birthed into, into print, as it were, and only now is reaching its destination in the video game. The corollary of this claim is that the newly emerging critical and theoretical work around gaming will therefore contribute significantly to our understanding of what modernism is and how we might best understand it aesthetically, formally, and historically. As I said, it's a hugely contentious claim. You can hold me responsible for all of this stuff in the Q&A session. But I have a microphone so I get to make bold claims. <laughs> and, but, and so to begin, I just want to unfold these ideas by looking at magazines as arguably one of the very first new media of the late 19th century. One every bit as transformative and influential as film, the phonograph, the telephone, and television. But you should be protesting. I know you are. The magazines and things like them have been around almost since the invention of movable type. How could they possibly be new? The answer lies, in part, in the very magazine whose centenary we mark today, Blast. By way of comparison, take a look at some of the other magazines from the period, even those that were considered the most avant-garde. Oh, very fun. <laughs> um, right, so the, the, this, is, this is it. Like, this is where modernism, we'd like to say, happened. Right? And as you can see, this looks incredibly dull. <laughs> I mean, you know, the great innovation here, this is, this is you know, blue ink. See? But still. Um, uh, the ego is this is printed on very cheap newsprint, uh, you know, no, not, no kind of cover or anything like that at all. I mean, just think about this in comparison to modern magazines, for example. I mean, something you pick up off the newsstand, all of this just says fustiness, right? Uh, this is, this is a, an episode of James Joyce's Ulysses, so this great avant-garde work, right, the thing that leads the modernist revolution, we might say, and it looks totally dull typographically. Uh, it appeared in this issue of the Little Review, which was their most innovative typographically because they used wallpaper as a cover. <laughs> Far short of Vogue, right, to be honest. Uh, or even Time Magazine or anything else. Okay. So, great, I guess. Okay. But not really innovative. Uh, and so we would say uh, that the colors, the topography, the layout of Blast, right, that big pink magazine with which we began, right, all those things seem totally distinctive from this. Right? It appeared a single signal that this journal is something new, something totally shocking. In a word, it must be modernist. Right? Well, that's only true if we look at a certain handful of elite magazines. But take a look instead at the advertising page from McClure's magazine. Let's see. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, go one more forward if you would. Okay? Um, so that stuff looks cool, right? Right up until we look at the popular magazines of the period. So you just saw these, are, these magazines are being produced actually 10 years earlier than some of the stuff I just showed you, in some cases 20 years earlier. This stuff looks more interesting, more like blast, more innovative, more exciting. Suddenly, in other words, when you look at this, blast, that big pink magazine, doesn't look so new. Right? It doesn't look so innovative. Now, it's still striking, absolutely, but I'd like to begin by arguing that it actually draws heavily on the technological revolution that had already made magazines into a new medium. Indeed, into the first genuinely mass medium of the 20th century. Right? The magazines perceived television and radio and cinema as the first mass medium of the 20th century. And so to understand how that happened, I just want to give you a, a few very brief milestones in that transformation. Okay. Yeah, so. The first and most important of these uh, is the invention of halftone printing. Right? And th there's a long history here that I'm going to cram into like 30 seconds. 
Uh, basically, you all know what halftone printing is. It's that amazing trick of the eye where using a series of black and white dots, you can produce pre-produced photographs. So if I were to blow this up, it would look like a pointless painting. The closer you get to it, dot matrix printers, if you know, you're old enough to remember those things, uh, work on the same principle. Right? And so what this allowed was the very inexpensive reproduction of images for the first time. Magazines throughout the 19th century, if you've ever seen one, uh, two columns of print, almost always very closely printed. If they had illustrations, they were woodcuts or lithographs. Very expensive things to reproduce. Right? This allowed for something that we now take for granted as being part of a magazine. Inexpensive reproduction of images. And I give you here what we think are the two first halftone images that appeared. Uh, the one on the right is from the Philadelphia Daily Graphic uh, in 1873, and the other one is from the 1873 Canadian Illustrated News. Right, and this opened up an enormous transformation in mass and popular culture, uh, in part because, uh, as you can see already in the graphic news, in the Philadelphia Daily Graphic, uh, right, advertisers seized on this stuff. Right? And that's still what we like to look at in magazines. That's still where the sort of interesting stuff in magazines are, are the advertisements. Right, and so that magazine that I was showing you before, if you jump ahead one more slide, Muncie's, right, this guy's a genius, okay, Frank Muncie. You don't know who he is, but he's a genius. <laughs> uh, and he's a genius because he was the first one to realize that, that with these images, what he could sell was not magazines to the public, but the public to manufacturers who wanted the public to buy their goods. Right? Uh, and thus, advertising is sort of born as a mass phenomenon. Right, and here, this is Edison's sort of record player being advertised over here from Fleur's magazine. So Muncie drops the price of his magazine from 25 cents to 10 cents. So, right, so he's actually taking a loss of at least 15 cents on every magazine he sells, hoping that he's going to make the money up by selling advertising, which he does. And this is why magazines only cost a couple of bucks when you go to buy them on the newsstand. This is why newspapers are inexpensive, but also why they're in a crisis. Right? Advertisers aren't, aren't directing as much revenue to them. Uh, so magazines and newspapers find themselves uh, in something of difficulty. But this, this is what makes mass print available to everyone. Right? You no longer need wealthy people to subscribe to magazines. Anybody can put down five or ten cents for a magazine. Right? And that's because it's the advertisements that are being sold to you. Right? Or rather, you're being sold to the advertisers. And this was all made possible because those advertisements were very inexpensive to print because they were all using halftone printing. Um, now, unfortunately, these, these magazines, you can't quite see this, but you can sort of see it. The, magazine, the advertisements in magazines were numbered separately from the rest of the magazine, and they were, they were put at the front and the back of the magazines and printed on different paper. Okay. Uh, and so what this meant was, when the magazine arrived, you pulled the magazine out of its advertising wrappers. The magazine might be 100 pages long. In the case of McClure's, it would have 250 pages of advertisements wrapped. Right? And the idea was just to pull this thing out and every library in the United States did this. They pulled the two things apart and threw the advertisements away. Right, so this rich part, the thing that's now most interesting to us about magazines, these advertisements, are almost entirely gone. Because right, all the institutions that we charged with paying attention to this stuff, safeguarding it, they threw all the good stuff away. Uh, and McClure's, if you've ever read it, not a great magazine. The advertisements, absolutely fascinating. This has created what we call the hole in the archive. Uh, and so we've been trying to recover this through the modern, at the Modernist Journals Project. Right, and so all of this is to say that when you look at magazines, what really makes them interesting in, in this period, I think, is the stuff that, that, that got thrown away, is the advertising. I mean, this is, this is pretty interesting stuff, right? At, at least as visually compelling as the cover of Blast. Right? Think about the, the typographic experiments that I showed you in that early slide of Blast. Where they're using capital letters, and it looks really cool. Well, you know, here's McClure's from 1910. Right, so four years before Blast appears. Right? And you can see all the same techniques being used. In fact, some other things that Blast hadn't even quite thought of yet. So when we look at magazines this way, we can connect Blast to a much larger media network, one that reaches far beyond a handful of elite avant-garde titles, to encompass mass print culture, advertising, and the explosion of visual culture across an array of new media in the early 20th century. I mean, you know, the only thing I can say that sort of helped get this, I mean, just you can't imagine what life in the 19th century was like. With, it lacked images. We're surrounded by images now, right? thanks to halftone printing, thanks to these advertisements. The 19th century was a, a time bereft of that kind of visual culture. And this still, of course, forms an unfolding 
uh, still, it forms part of a still unfolding modernism that informs and structures our own digital media. So let me put my argument to you even more directly. Magazines anticipate and encode key aspects of what we call, or what we now recognize as our own digital culture. As a result, new media theory, and particularly new theories about games, help us better understand magazines, just as magazines will help us better understand how new media works. Modernism thus remains a vital aesthetic and cultural resource, albeit one channeled less through particular forms, like the stream of consciousness, or a period like the 1920s, than through the material and social practices embedded in its most influential medium, the magazine. Now, I want to explore this today by looking specifically at Black Spaniels. That extraordinary magazine whose centenary we're marking. If you've never seen or heard of this thing, first of all, come to the exhibit that's following the talk, I guess. I was just looking at it earlier. It's got phenomenal stuff in it. Uh, but I'll give you just a few in particulars here. It was edited uh, by this shady looking character. Uh, <laughs> Wyndham Lewis, who was an inventive avant garde painter, novelist, and poet, fame infamous for his outrageous claims and his bombastic personality. He famously called himself the enemy and stalked around London wearing a, a, a cloak and a wide-brimmed slouch hat that he, he would tilt down over his eyes. He feuded with everyone he ever met. I mean, everyone hated Lewis, and Lewis hated everyone right back. Uh, he was sued, he wrote these, he wrote these books. He would then, I mean, like, he did that thing we often think authors do, right? So he would meet you, and if he didn't like you, he'd put you in a book and he'd kill you. He would say horrible things about you in the book. He was sued six times for libel. Uh, he founded something called the Rebel Art Center as a sort of attempt to break away from the English uh, uh, avant-garde painting. He decided that the Rebel Art Center wasn't rebellious enough and so broke with them too. Uh, later in his career, he flirted with fascism. This has created a blot over him. He wrote a book about Hitler, but then rejected it. And this is just a, by the way, at his death, uh, an autopsy turned up a tumor the size of a fist in his brain. Um, it probably killed him, but it may have contributed to some of the other things. Blast itself, which we're going to be talking about, barely fits the definition of a magazine. There are only two issues, so you know, I think you'd say any magazine you at least need well, two issues, right? The promise of something to come. Um, and it oh, likely only sold a thousand copies total. Unlike other avant-garde magazines, it's a mishmash of people and ideas. There are at least eight different manifestos, kind of a weird thing for a magazine. Right? Everybody wanted to say what they believed, and they all believed different things, it turns out. Uh, in addition to work by Lewis, it included stuff by Ezra Pound, T.S. Eliot, Ford Maddox Huffer, uh, and Rebecca West, as well as visual art by Wadsworth, Epstein, Breshka, and Gore. But its, its influence was enormous, and it remains one of the most famous and perhaps extraordinary magazines from this uh, golden age of magazines. And I've just put up here. Uh, this is, the, this is the Pompidou Center, the sort of the, the mecca of modern art in Paris, uh, where behind all of the exhibits now they have this amazing wallpaper that's just covers of little magazines, the thousands and thousands of little magazines that were published in the early 20th century. It's why we call this the golden age of magazines. All right, one more slide, please. So I'm going to take you, you saw Press Start earlier, right? I'm taking you through a video game here, so we're going to play level one first. Uh, we will get to the boss fight. <laughs> So first I'm going to talk about chunking. So for a reader, Blast presents some real problems. Problems that have actually kept them, not just this magazine, but almost all magazines at the edge of our critical attention. The main problem is that it's very hard to decide what a magazine is and how it goes about producing meaning. Ezra Pound called this the mess and muddle of magazines. And Robert Scholes noted that the word magazine itself derives from a term used to refer to a miscellaneous collection of, of things, and, and it evolved in opposition to the idea of the museum, where things were actually organized according to a plan. Indeed, it's, it's much closer to the French word magazine, the grand magazine, the department stores of Paris, the great 19th century department stores of Paris, where indeed unrelated things are kind of jammed together in novel and inviting ways. So there's no plot to a magazine, no stable set of characters, no recognizable forms and metrics. So how do we make sense of it? Eliot and Pound, who were themselves some of the finest literary editors of the 20th century, and certainly great talent scouts, both recognize the challenge this presents. Seeking out something like an author that is trying to make sense of a magazine even as he was producing them, Pound insisted in a 1930 essay called Small Magazines that successful magazines must have what he called a program. Any program at all, he didn't care if it was right or wrong. The idea was just it needed to mean something. It is, he asserted, not so important that an editorial policy should be right, 
as that it su su should succeed in expressing and giving clear definition to a policy or a set of ideas. I suspect even Wyndham Lewis himself eventually grew to accept this idea and move away from the potentially quite revolutionary potential of a magazine like Blast and the explosive chaos its name suggests. His next magazine, called The Enemy, was actually perfectly Poundian in this sense. Its program was so rigid, so consistent, and so absolute that its editor found only one kind of work that would suit its purpose, his own. Right? So that's one of the things that makes this a hilarious magazine. Okay. Right? It's like, well, the only people that made the cut were me. <laughs> um, I, edit, I edit a journal, sometimes I tend to. <laughs> now I want to argue that Elliot and Pound alike, despite their brilliance as critics and editors, fundamentally misunderstood the magazine as a form and its importance to the aesthetic revolution of modernism that they actually helped to invent. They seek, that is, to imagine the magazine, to confine the magazine, to treat it as if it were a kind of book, organized not by an editor, but by an author. Thus, a successful magazine by their lights comes to look like, uh, comes to look not like a grand magazine, but a musty museum in which readers are not allowed to handle the objects, not allowed to move them about or put them into alternative relationships with one another. This is maybe what led Pound to famously leave his post at the Little Review, one of the little magazine I showed you earlier, writing in a huff to Joyce at the time that Margaret Anderson and Jane Heap, those editresses, have merely messed and muddled never to their own loss. I mean, Pound's a jerk, but the, you know, this is a jerky quote, but still. So what he fails to recognize here is that the mess and muddle of magazines is exactly the point. Right? It constitutes a distinctive media form that is distinctive to modernism. Reading amid that mess and muddle invites us to flip back and forth between pages, to create unanticipated or unauthorized connections, and to see in the advertisements, articles, essays, poems, and illustrations a figure for modernity's complexity that need not resolve itself into those things that Pound and Elliot liked, order, myth, program. This interactivity is the core element of what I'm calling the magazine aesthetic of modernism, and it's one that reaches deeply and obviously into our own digital era. The first readers of Blast certainly encountered the same problem. They couldn't make sense of the thing. Right? The magazine begins with a manifesto that blasts England, its climate and its isolation as an island. The Atlantic becomes a thousand mile long body of water pushed against us from the Floridas to make us mild. Yet, just a few pages later, the same manifesto then blesses England, its climate, its isolation, and its vast planetary abstraction of ocean. Confronted with such contradictions, the irascible critic J.C. Squire, whom I quoted here, sneered that the magazine was little more than a stunt, one that didn't even measure up to the, mere co to the more coherent avant-gardism of other movements like Fauvism and Futurism. We have a movement here, he writes, not even a mistaken one. All we have is a heterogeneous mob suffering from juvenile decay. Good Failure, however, is just another word for my understanding of modernism. And I would like to argue that this is not a failure of the magazine, but of its readers. A failure etched now in clear relief by key aspects of our digital culture. And now I'll shift here to some video game theory. As Lev Manovich argues in the language of new media, there are a number of striking connections between the avant-garde practices of magazine making and the digital interfaces we now use to interact with the abstractions of machine-readable data. New media objects, he contends, are rarely created from scratch. Usually they are assembled from ready-made parts. Put differently, in computer culture, authentic creation has been replaced by selection from a menu. A menu a bit like the one I put up here, this is the table of contents for blacks. Digital creation emerges between a set of scripted actions on the one hand and a set of transformable, recombinant objects iterated lines of code, captured images, tables of data, etc. on the other. Digital games in particular typically involve players combining procedural actions, a trigger pull, a button click, and so on, with data that has been rendered in abstract ways, as a gun barrel, a door, a monster, or an angry bird. Readers or players of the text succeed by themselves exploring the ways in which they can interact with this data by shaping it into more or less successful interpretive configurations. As a result, the idea of progression and linearity we find in things like novels and narrative film actually make no sense for either a digital text or a magazine. What, after all, is the right way to read Blast? 
To flip pages, to flip to random pages of a novel is an oddity. An attempt to work against the logic of the medium. You never pick a novel up and sort of read it from the middle, see if you like it, read a little bit at the end. Um, but to flip through a magazine this way makes perfect sense, right? In fact, it's kind of weird to read a magazine from beginning to end, and you kind of misunderstood what you've got in your hands. And in doing so, of course, a reader, you're moving pieces around. You're putting uh, pieces of this object table in unanticipated relationships to one another and finding new kinds of potentially emergent meanings of interest to you. So in this sense, BLAST requires a very specific kind of cognitive activity associated with gameplay and other kinds of information processing called chunking. Put simply, this is a process in which an experienced player combines small elements of a closed system into patterns or objects, chunks, that can be processed more quickly. So here's how, uh, here's how a pair of critics describe this and how it works in a game of chess. The master of chess has acquired an immense memory for chess positions, organized as a collection of chunks. His ability for immediate perception and short-term memory of chess positions depends directly on how many chunks are used to encode a position. By implication, master players must spend an immense amount of time in the game in order to acquire a larger and larger number of chunks. Similarly, computer programming depends upon the ability to combine lines of code into chunks or composite objects that can then be assembled and reassembled at a higher level. If you know anything about game design, you don't start by like typing into DOS, right, or something like that. It's not C++. Plus 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 plus. Um, right? You actually use game engines where that it gives you rendered worlds and rendered actions. Everything's sort of already there as pieces that you then move into relationship with one another. It's one of the reasons video games often tend to start to look alike, right, and why they fall into certain genres. It's because you're playing with the same set of, uh, of game engines. There are only four or five games from the engine. And I would say that in Blast, something similar happens. The images, manifestos, fiction, poetry, plays, and so on, cannot be made into a single linear whole. Indeed, one of the magazines, in, one of, in one of the magazine's manifestos, it explicitly rejects the idea of coherence. We start from opposite statements of a chosen world set up violent structures of adolescent clearness between two extremes. We discharge ourselves on both sides. In an object filled with these kinds of contradictions and structured around points of random access, chunking allows us, allows us to discern individual elements as they are arranged and circulated through a complex system. Typically, these units align with the individual pieces or contributors. Thus, we can detect, for example, the clear tensions here between the abstraction at the heart of Lewis's idea of vorticism and the more clearly imagist ideas articulated by Pound. But another way, that's why there's so many manifestos here. Nobody really agreed what Blast was or what they were doing. And so uh, an expert chunker like myself, somebody that knows a lot about modernism and can come play the game of Blast, I understand how these pieces fit together or don't fit together, and I can pull them into different arrangements than someone who doesn't know that might be able to do. So an expert player of the magazine, for example, might discern uh, the imagist ideas at work in Pound's Vortex, which asserts the importance of language and the primacy of the image and the elimination of extraneous detail. Indeed, the odd fit between the imagist chunk and the vorticist one is best exemplified by the fact that Pound simply changed the title of an essay he'd written from imagism to vorticism without changing its content. And so he just decided like, one day, OK, I'm a vorticist now. So this essay called Imagism is now called vorticism. They didn't change actually what he meant by those terms. So such, the kind of chunking I'm describing here takes place not only between individual, not only between individual items, but within them. Trying to make sense of a mode of writing that clearly exceeds or contests the standards of typical magazine prose, Marjorie Perloff describes, quote, the rhythm units that are hardly sentences. Herself an outstanding reader of poetry, she chunks the magazine and its sentences as if they were poems, using the idea of rhythm, typography, sound, and spatial arrangement on the page to bring some sense of meaning or order to Blast, and particularly to those pages of Blasts and Blesses. Indeed, to read Blast, you have to begin with this process of chunking, intervening actively to group elements together or break them up into meaningful units that are neither linear nor self-evident. But this begs the question, what do you do with these chunks? If we can begin to discern different units that are alinear and that don't necessarily align with the table of contents, then how do we make sense of the relation between them? Understanding why Blast might be a game rather than a collection of chunks thus requires us to go to another level. So we'll turn now from the magazine as a physical object to better understand the dynamic affordances of its rules. Right? So level two, you made it. 
<laughs> Theorists have long debated the precise nature of games, and though no single definition exists, there is certainly agreement that they depend upon a mutually agreed upon set of rules. This kind of agreement creates what Katie Salen and Eric Zimmerman call, quote, the magic circle of game space, a shorthand for the idea of a special place in time and space created by the game. Entering such a space requires players to accept arbitrary, often intense constraints on their actions for the pleasure of gaming. Thus, we agree, for example, not to touch a soccer ball with our hands, or to stop playing when the ball leaves the field of play. In fact, we would say the field is that magic circle. It's the thing that will get you yelled at if you pick up the ball with your hands in the middle of the field, but as soon as it rolls over the line, you can pick it up. For the designers and theorists of video games, the artificial imposition of the magic circle uh, are constantly in focus since the rules they encode in programs are governed by the specific tolerances of hardware and software used to fashion a virtual environment. The system imposes constraints on both the creator, creator and the player so that creativity becomes less a, an act of pure romantic invention than a set of dynamic responses to a fixed set of agreed upon rules. Game design, in other words, is as much about constraint as freedom, about discovering the potential for new meaning emerging from the interaction between fixed rules and chunked items on an object table. I will look close, we'll look more closely at emergence in a moment, but first we need to consider the ways in which constraint works in Blast. Software and game designers typically refer to these constraints as affordances. A term used to describe the action possibilities in an object, the physical, material, and conceptual properties that both make possible and limit what an agent can do with it. In the software world, this is a pretty easy concept to understand. Right, I can click on the file menu inside a word processing program and be afforded several actions, like saving or printing a document. My choices, however, are limited. Right? They're all right there on that little table. I can't say, write my paper for me, right? or translate this into French. The affordances of magazines, however, are more difficult to determine, particularly since they vary across time and even between periodicals. And yet they became an important part of modernism, as McGann notes in his analysis of Pound's poetry. Pound, he wrote, felt that the renewal of the resources of poetry in an age of advanced mechanical reproduction required the artist to bring all aspects of textual production under the aegis of the imagination. Nothing was to be taken for granted. The poetry would be brought forth not simply at the linguistic level, but in every feature of the media available to the scriptural imagination. To understand the modernist magazine, therefore, we have to think about more clearly about the action possibilities unique to these objects that might include, but aren't limited to things like reading the periodical from beginning to end, backwards to uh, back to front, reading a few pages, skipping around, right, skimming the magazine by reading passages and looking at occasional images. Uh, using the table of contents to identify articles of interest and then moving to them, uh, avoiding sort of patterns that may have been imagined or imposed by the editor, navigating within individual articles by using headers and subheaders to identify items of interest. One might also recognize or construct or imagine links to other texts that lie outside the object itself, an affordance similar to the hyperlink that invites the reader to connect, construct connections between this and other issues of the magazine. Right, you might see this encoded in the things that say to be continued in the next issue, for example. Or more actively, right, it's certainly one thing a magazine affords, and in a way even novels don't quite, is you can take a pair of scissors to the thing, cut it up, glue it into your scrapbook with something else. Right? Create connections that no editor could have imagined initially. Right, and I put this slide up here because one of the clever things, you know, that when you look at this magazine and tilt it straight up and down, the, the thing's running, the title's running diagonally across the, the cover, right? But one thing that, that Lewis apparently recognized was when you carry a magazine around, that's actually not very convenient because your arm covers up the title. I don't have this object with me. But you know, when you print something diagonally and then you carry it around town, as they did famously, right, with glass showing, it's, it's its own advertisement. So that's why the title's running sideways across the thing. Very clever. Right? They did other kinds of things, too, like leave these things all over pubs around London so people would pick them up and be shot. So when we compare these options that I've just described to the affordances of a codex book, it becomes obvious that the magazine has a much higher degree of affordance. Books, after all, afford agents very few possibilities for action beyond reading the text in a linear, linear serial order. As I said, you could decide to read like, you know, every third page in a book or in a novel or something, but it would be weird. Uh, whereas 
No one would think that was all unusual for a magazine. Some kinds of skimming are also made available by the addition of an index or the use of chapter titles, but in general, the codex book is more highly constrained, while the magazine affords a great many more possibilities for agents. And that difference, I want to argue, is not just one of degree, but of kind. And it's precisely this considerably expanded affordance that makes the magazine a fundamentally new media form. In just the same way that the phonograph, film, or early hypertext afforded new kinds of agentive possibilities, so too did the modern magazines. Indeed, we might best understand magazines not as derivatives of the book at all, but as a distinctive array of radically new software designs that operate on the hardware of ink and paper. And this new software initiated key elements of the intermedial aesthetic experiments in form, genre, and character we still haplessly call modernism. Blast, I think it's easy to see, sets out to brilliantly and deliberately test the affordances of the magazines as a physical object, which might be one of the reasons its release was greeted with such baffled outrage and confusion. I already talked a little bit about the cover. Oh, sorry. That's perfect. Right? Um, Images are scattered seemingly at random throughout the magazine, creating the vortex itself called for in the manifesto, perhaps by spinning things together. There's no real reason why the images appear to be aligned the way they are. No introductory essay, no nothing that says these things belong together for a particular reason. We might be tempted to read them as illustrations. This is what most people would have expected of an image that showed up in a magazine in the mid-20th century. Right? But there's nothing here that labels them as illustrations. And we might ask, how does Timon of Athens uh, for example, illustrate, that's the amount of image I have here, the bizarre play Enemy of the Stars, if it's even doing so. And how do we make sense of the martial title of abstract images like Plan of War and Slow Attack that I've got up here? Are these images related to one another? Are they related to the play in with which they're interleaved? Or is this just the turbine that Pound describes in his manifesto, into which all experience rushes? In the same manifesto, Pound attacks the passive receiving of impressions and celebrates the playful power of culture as a game in which one is directing fluid force against circumstance. Again, this isn't pure romantic creation, but is instead a power of creativity shaped by constraint and affordance, by, circum by what Pound here calls circumstance, and by what the magazine itself makes visible to us as the materiality of page and print. We see the same fascination with constraint in the experiments with typography as well, especially in those opening pages of blasts and blesses. Uh, let's see, I'm going to skip just a little bit of this. Um, yeah, if we could have the next slide. Yeah, so these are, this, is, this is a bit what I'm talking about, right? So I'm just, this is just a sense to give you some of the, the ways in which uh, Lewis, in particular, is testing the importance magazine. So he creates these fabulous lists of blasts and blasts, or blasts and blesses, uh, which uh, you probably can't read those too well from the audience, but um, this is a sort of nonsense list, and I can tell you that it's completely opaque to us now. It was largely opaque to readers at the time. Uh, but it, 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 it's, it gives you a sense in which they're trying to test the importance of the magazine. So because you'll read anything in a magazine and think it means something, let's put stuff up here and see why you think I'm blessing, blessing or blasting. Uh, so I'll give just one uh, sort of clever example here, I think. Feacham is blasted here, right? Pills, Opera, and Tonks. So apparently all three of these Beechams. Right? Uh, and Beecham's pills are actually uh, uh, laxative. Okay. So why Lewis is blasting them, I don't know. But he's also tying them here to Thomas Beecham, who founded a famous London opera company, uh, which created the kind of art and music that Pound hated, which he's here tying, clearly tying to the effect of a laxative uh, on the mind and body, I suppose. But in, over here, in the blesses, uh, let's see if I can find it, uh, he, blesses, he blesses castor oil, right? Another kind of purgative. Right? And so what are we supposed to do with this sort of apparent blessing and blasting of these purgative agents? Right? And, and I don't think there's an answer to that. Right? I think Pound is using the importance of the magazine to make us play this game. Where do we find contradictions? How do these two lists fit together? Right? And what are we doing with this set of connections? Right here, you can see another testing of the affordance. This is a poem that, um, uh, by T. S. Eliot that has, has some lines deliberately blacked out by the press, presumably out of fear of censorship. Uh, and you know, you can see here that rather than simply censor the lines, they actually they've actually used uh, uh, some kind of something. I don't know exactly what they used at the printer, 
uh, to mark these lines out, to show you right, the ways in which the magazine is itself constrained by, uh, by English censors. Uh, so using the power of print itself, the magazine makes clear the ways in which legal and moral censors are still shaping the contents and the affordances of 20th century poetry, imposing a, imposing a sense of community here that uh, excludes new kinds of art and experiences. As I hope even this brief survey makes clear, one of the things that makes Blast important, both as an avant-garde magazine and as a kind of game, is precisely its fascination with the affordances of print culture. The magazine, in effect, becomes something like that magic circle I described, in which the editors agree to adhere to the physical constraints of the print medium, but then explore and test those constraints to see what kind of new possibilities for expression they might afford. Like the player in a first-person shooter game who immediately tries to see if she can shoot a partner, right? or like a player in an RPG who tries to play without killing anything, we find ourselves attempting both to test these affordances, right? what are the limits of blast, and to trifle with them. What can I do to make to work against the grain? How can I make this magazine work against itself? To make it meaningful to me. In order to see what kinds of readings might, as I said, might be generated here. So seen this way, Blast becomes less a text to be interpreted than a game to play in which narrative fragments are chunked, tested, and reassembled within a tight set of physical constraints, the pages of the magazine itself. In advancing now to the next level, We'll see how these ba basic ludic elements contribute to a more general exploration of emergent play in Blast. Right, so here we are, level three emergence. This is the big one. Now I've already asked you to think about two key concepts that help us think about magazines that come from game theory. Right? Chunking and affordance. Neither, however, lets us, yet lets us understand how a magazine produces meaning, or really why it's like a game. So to tackle this idea, I want to turn now to the concept of emergence. It's a complex term, it's got many definitions that extend across fields as diverse as economics, biology, you see the migrating birds here, and computer science. Put simply, it describes the patterned yet mathematically unpredictable behaviors that arise from the interaction of elements within a closed system. Right? So we know that birds, when they fly and migrate migratory patterns like this, they form shapes and patterns. You see a beautiful one here. You cannot predict those patterns from any one bird uh, going in, or from any set of systems uh, governing their, their path of flight. But to give an example from games, in a game of soccer, right, such interactions involve cascading arrays of feedback loops in which very simple rules and objects interact to form complex outcomes. Right? So put simply, right, we like to watch soccer games or football games or whatever sporting event we, we might like because we know there are very basic rules that govern that system. Those systems quickly become so complex that we can't predict the outcome. And so I would care. Maybe we watch the soccer game to know who's going to win. Right? How are these rules going to be applied? Crucially, as I said, these outcomes are not inherent with any one object or rule, and thus appear, and thus only appear or emerge relationally. So here's how Catherine Hales describes this. Emergence shows <laughs> any behavior that cannot be found in either a system's individual components or their additive properties, but that arises often unpredictably from the interaction of the system's components. For Hales, perhaps our most acute theorist, in fact, of hypertext fiction, emergence explains the way meaningful patterns develop in contemporary digital literature from the interaction of mobile pieces of text that flicker on and off a computer screen. As a literary critical term, emergence describes what Bruce Clark and Mark Hansen call the openness from closure principle of autopoetic systems. The unique ability, again, of a closed, rule-bound system to produce a staggering array of different and shifting meanings from the varied interplay of fixed parts. As we have already seen, glass consists of chunkable units that interact independently with one another, while also testing the affordances of the magazine as a physical object. Using a less technical language, we could say that Blast becomes something like a game for its readers to play. Readers who are encouraged by the manifestos to see themselves as individuals who must confront these structural features in order to draw meaning from its pages. After all, Blast's meaning finally resides not in its individual units, but in the interactions between them that cannot be predicted or determined in advance. So it makes it a magazine rather than just a collection of things. And for a long time, literary critics tried to ignore the idea of the magazine and just look at those things. This is an Eliot poem. I know what that is. I know I make sense of it. Why it's sitting here next to this painting? Uh, not my problem, right? I don't know where it's going. 
So if blast has any meaning, it's because we need to look at these interactions between the different elements. And Dean, as readers, we find ourselves in the aftermath of the very explosion described by the title, surrounded by disparate, disparate chunks from whose shifting arrangement meaning arises. This chaos, I would argue, is what makes blast important, even if it's the very thing that has so befuddled critics. It creates its own magic circle between, the, between its covers and challenges us to devise rules that might make it meaningful, innovative, or artful. Almost all of the English avant-garde is contained here, and it's up to us to play through it in ways that might allow meaning to emerge. Greeted by the arrival of this magazine, Violet Hunt was one of the few who seems to have glimpsed the underlying ergodic or ludic aims of the magazine. Those are the fancy words for preference. People didn't know what to make of it, she wrote. And generally, they made it wrong. Now, I'm interested here less in the idea of right and wrong than in the notion that readers made this magazine. Hunt got that, right, by assembling it into more or less artful playthroughs. I can offer you here now lots of different ways of playing through Blast, by looking, for example, at the role of women, who are at once Blast, blessed, included as fellow artists, and yet often objectified sexually and physically as symbols of a decadent culture. Alternatively, we could look at the ways abstraction and juxtaposition function in the magazine, seeing in them a tension and overlap between image and text, and see their possible models for the spinning contradictions of the vortex itself. To wrap up, though, I want to focus on some chunks or elements of the magazine that seem to be about play, or at least about the way in which play takes shape through the imposition of rules that nevertheless afford diverse, unpredictable, and emergent outcomes. Now I'm going to start, yeah, this is, this is perfect. I'm going to start with uh, The Strangest Thing in Blast, a, a play or a drama written by Lewis entitled Enemy of the Stars. If you've ever attempted to read this thing, I'm sorry. Uh, it's a sin of omission uh, created by nearly all of Blast's readers, if that's any comfort. Because you'll realize almost immediately that it tests sternly the affordances of dramatic form. It's a difficult, though not impossible, to imagine a way to stage the thing. And the advertisement, this is the first page of the play, in fact suggests some kind of connection between the characters and the viewers. Unlike a typical dramatist persona, after all, it doesn't actually name the characters. Their names are Ogle and Ham. Doesn't show up here. And describes them instead only as two heathen clowns before asserting that the play is very well acted by you and me. Almost immediately, in other words, it becomes clear that Lewis is exploiting the doubleness of, word, of the word play. Of the word play. That is, if this is a play, it's also a play, a game. This is both a drama to be acted and observed, but also a game whose magic circle here is some bleak surface, uncovered, carefully chosen. Uh, we must agree to enter. Passive observation thus gives way to ludic engagement. And indeed, when we do enter, we find that it doesn't look like a drama at all. There is dialogue, but it's not associated with individual characters or speakers. Indeed, the bulk of the play seems to consist of unattributed descriptions or stage directions. Rather than observers of the action, in other words, we become participants who must attempt to parse or chunk this into something like a play in which there are characters and events and scenes, as well as rising and falling action. As Scott Klein, one of the few people I know who's actually written about this thing, Right, in, in, in an attempt to make sense of it, uh, writes, the central character, Argyll, attempts to cut himself off almost entirely from the world of human perception in an ultimately failed attempt to cultivate and preserve some absolutely purified sense of self. He is, in this sense, a figure not only of pure egoism or vorticist isolation, but of an autonomy utterly opposed to the idea of emergent meaning. He's the opposite of a game. He doesn't want to be in a game. He wants to just be himself. Uh, he's closed off, in other words, from contingency and uncertainty. He comes to resemble something like the new critical ideal of an aesthetic text, something that's fixed, immovable, and absolute. As the play unfolds, however, our goal's autonomy is breached when he attempts to defend himself against Ham. This uh, engagement with others the text calls acting, and Ham murders our goal for violating his principles of isolation. We have in this play, I would therefore argue, a kind of metaphor for the magazine as a whole. If we see Argyll as a figure for the radical egoism of the artist that the Blast manifestos appear to defend, or as a symbol of a pure work of art, then his murder suggests that neither art nor artist can survive without play. 
Rather than being fixed, in other words, the magazine and art more generally depends upon emergence, upon the unpredictable kind of acting that finally proves fatal to our goal. This is not to say that the enemy of the stars manages to embrace some form of radical post-structuralism. After all, him too kills himself at the end, his own existence made suddenly, suddenly meaningless by Argyll's absence. This suggests that there's actually an essential and sustaining tension here between these two figures, between the rules on the one hand and play on the other, and meaning emerges at the intersection between them. Uh, there are some other examples here too. I'm actually going to skip one of these just in the interest of time. Uh, but I, I, you can make an argument here about this one of the images called the dancers, which uh, you can see visually seems to encode some of Perhaps you can see some of the same contradictions. Now, so far I've looked only at individual items or chunks in the magazine to identify these ludic moments where art and play become entangled. But when we begin to look at the magazine as a whole, the game becomes even more complex as we try to imagine the relationship between the individual elements. This image of the, of the dancers, for example, bears some striking resemblance to Ford Maddox Ford's The Saddest Story. By all accounts, the inclusion of this story in the magazine was somewhat accidental, since Ford himself had little to do with Fordicism and certainly didn't sign on to any of its manifestos. He basically gave this piece to them as a favor. And indeed, if we chunk his story into a unit with Rebecca West's uh, story about marriage and indissoluble matrimony, something critics have often done, that it seems indeed to be a kind of collection of late impressionist works interested primarily in sense perception and the subjective nature of knowledge. The story actually surrounds, this story, the, the Ford story, actually surrounds Robert's dancers, almost as if this image were a kind of illustration for it. And the piece turns powerfully on a kind of interpretive game. The story, uh, the saddest story is, is focalized through the consciousness of John Dowell, who relates his experiences with Edward Ashburn and his wife, Lenora. This is only a section of what would become Ford's masterful novel, The Good Soldier. But even in this fragment, we can see that the story turns on the fact that Dowell is a deeply unreliable narrator, who cannot understand the complexity of the human relationships around him, including the destructive love, love affair unfolding between his own wife and Edward Ashburn. To read this story, therefore, is to encounter the same kinds of constraints that define Robert's paintings, right, or define the enemy of the stars. Since we can only see the through, we can only see the world through Dowell's eyes, and thus try to make sense of it by playing with the implications of his highly constrained vision. Like this is like, like much impressionist fiction. We know we're only getting an impression, and we feel increasingly constrained in this novel until we realize we can't trust the narrator who's feeding us this. Thing. We, therefore, have to guess, we have to gamble, we have to speculate, figure out what isn't Dowell telling us, what's going on beyond this constrained view that's been offered to us. In the novel, of course, this play eventually comes to an end when Edward's various, and I'm guessing, comes to an end when Edward's various and increasingly scandalous affairs are revealed and he cuts his own throat. In the fragment here, however, we lack that resolution and thus conclude with an open-ended speculation that requires us to intervene and fix the meaning of both Dowell and Ashburn. Now, in thinking about the interchange between Ford's story and Robert's painting and the other pieces of the magazine, I want to argue we can get to see more clearly how Blast as a whole functions as a kind of emergent game. Its own deliberate embrace of contradiction, its jumble of elements and movements, its embrace of radical visual design make this a fundamentally ludic work, one that actually reaches for, indeed even anticipates, key aspects of gaming culture. So let's go to the boss fight here, uncertainty. The great game theorist and sociologist Roger Calloy has argued that games are defined finally by uncertainty. Play, he writes, is uncertain activity. Doubt must remain until the end. Every game of skill, by definition, involves the risk for the player of missing a stroke and the threat of defeat, without which the game would no longer be pleasing. In fact, the game is no longer pleasing to one who, because he is too well trained or skillful, wins effortlessly and infallibly. From the moment Blast first appeared in its brilliant pink covers in London pubs, cafes, and bookshops, it invoked this sense of uncertainty and risk. Critics have labored for decades to make sense of Blast, from those like Squire who angrily dismissed it, to more measured contemporary scholars who have labored to classify it. At best, I would argue, such work has taken place largely at what I've called level one here, the level where its pieces are chunked up, often at the expense of the whole. 
when are we going to argue that Elliot's an impressionist? No, he's going to be a vorticist or an impressionist or an imagist. This has unquestionably yielded valuable insights about the underlying tensions between impressionism and expressionism, or the subtle contests at work between Pound, Lewis, Gudia Breshka, and the other contributors. As a result, both the magazine and the vorticism, which it claims to make manifest, end up both being somehow less than the sum of their parts. An abortive avant-garde movement for some, and a kind of brilliant, if miscellaneous, museum piece for others. Indeed, I suspect, and we'll see in the exhibition, Blast might well be the most displayed magazine of the modern era. And even if Enemy of the Stars and most of its other contents are the least read documents of the era. It looks great, but boy, you have to make sense of it. Better to put it under glass. Thanks to the work of game theorists, however, we are now in a position to move beyond that first level. We have a richer, more rigorous, critical, interpretive vocabulary to describe the complexity of an object like, like Blast that can't be made to cohere around a single agenda, manifesto, or aesthetic. Indeed, I'd argue that Pound and Lewis were both less editors than self-conscious game designers, who had come to realize that the avant-garde itself had become something like a game. Rather than simply replicating futurism, phobism, impressionism, all the other isms that had preceded them, they instead set out to conceive both vorticism and blast as a kind of game. This magazine remains remarkable even now because of the way it both effectively identified the constraints of print culture and then exploited those affordances. These tensions between constraint and play, furthermore, then became an essential part of their own aesthetic experiments, evident in those marked out lines in Eliot's poem, in the faintly visible dancing figures of Robert's painting, and even in the bewildering complexity of Enemy of the Stars. More than this, however, they assembled a movement that did not depend upon ideological coherence or intellectual unity. Instead, between the covers of Blast, they created a complex system governed by the constraints of print and ink, in which autonomous chunks of text could be combined and recombined in playful yet meaningful ways. Just as we are called upon to be the actors in Lewis's drama, so too are we called upon in, when, the opening, when opening the pages of this magazine to become players with this dynamic, uncertain, and ludic system. One more slide. This I, this I contend is why Lewis and his collaborators chose the vortex as the symbol for this movement, an image that makes several appearances throughout the magazine. It conveys motion, contradiction, opposition, complexity, and uncertainty. It exists only in motion, only in action, only when the game of blast is being played. We can see this in the individual chunks of the magazine and in their emergent interaction with one another where new meanings, new potentials, and new ideas spark into existence between and across individual elements. Their activation made possible by the constraints and affordances of the magazine as a physical object radically distinct from the Codex book. Indeed, as I claimed at the outset, this is what makes the magazine, this is what marks the magazine out as one of the first new media of the 20th century. And only now are we beginning to develop a way of describing and understanding that media revolution still unfolding around us. One more slide. The playthrough I've offered in this one lecture, however, of course, is simply that. One emergent possibility, selected from others and developed within the affordances and constraints of the game called Blast. The game can be played again and again. The kaleidoscope turns so its pieces are rearranged. And with each playthrough, a term I hope you'll now find more feasible than interpretation or reading, you must simply decide if you wish to save or quit, to preserve a particularly rich or skillful result, or to test again the affordances and emergence potential of blast. <laughs>